Hello! So today is going to be a little bit different, and I'm going to give an example of a construct map that's in a published uh, book chapter. So the book chapter is from a guy named O'Brien. He did this, published this back in the 90s, and it is on psychological functioning. Let's see if I can spell psychological. So psychological functioning can generally be thought of as this kind of global assessment of really how, how well are you just being able to function just in terms of just getting through everyday life as a just kind of well-adjusted and coping individual. Like, can you live and thrive? in a way that isn't detrimental to your um, experiencing everyday life. And so in this published example, we're gonna go through how do we evaluate um, and how are other authors giving um, construct maps for the phenomenon that they're studying and how do they kind of give uh, their reasoning for how items are placed in different locations and how do they describe individuals because it's a main part of this is all about connecting again it's all about connecting wow i cannot spell today so connecting that's supposed to be an e connecting items individuals. And that's the really the main focus of a construct map is to provide a description of individuals and items and item responses in a way that's justified for the given construct that we're trying to measure. So for this example of uh, based on uh, a guy named Michael O'Brien, this was published uh, I think in 97 um, it's based on the work of the, based on the MMP, MMPI, which is the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, very popular uh, psychological assessment that has like something ridiculous, like two or 300 items. Um, and he goes on to, to describe how, like describing items and like the importance of understanding patterns of responses. Uh, and it's a little bit outside of the scope of what uh, we're going to be talking about, but the main thing is that he is focusing on this assessment of global assessment of functioning uh, as part of the uh, DS, which is in the DSM. This is how old this uh, book chapter is in the DSM three. I believe we're now up to DSM six. Yes, I believe they're trying to publish the seventh by in the next couple of years. But DSM six, this is a little bit old, and so what they're doing is really trying to understand how items uh, are important for pathological disorders um, and how some type of pathological um, mental state is detrimental to your functioning. So one of the first parts that he gives for developing the, his, the scale of global global functioning is provide and assess an overview of his scale and the values and intended uh, scores that will be given. Um, and so he really sets it up by saying, consider psychological, social, and occupational functioning uh, on a hypothetical continuum of mental health illness, um, where in you do not include like impairment in functioning due to physical or environmental. So that really constrains what the definition of functioning is. So it really gives a strong general uh, definition for what is a functioning as intended to measure by the scale. And then he gives assessment of like, what are the, co he calls them codes, but really that's the score. Um, what is the scores that will be given um, to individuals? And he says that those four that have a fairly high scale, we describe them in this way. They are absent of 
uh, or have very minimum symptoms. Um, and they're really able to like not have too much anxiety. They're, I mean, just having generally satisfied, pretty good description. So if someone has a code and a score between like 81 and 90, that's what we would intend for them to represent. But as we get down to some of these like more middle range numbers of being like 50 and 60, it's talking about like moderate symptoms. Well, they kind of have a flat affect where their um, speech is kind of a uh, suspect or they are prone to panic attacks or you're just really having trouble connecting with individuals. Then you get into some of these more severe um, symptoms and severe characteristics of individuals like a danger of harming self or others, suicidality. These are some very severe characteristics. And so if we have and provide these types of values to represent functioning and represent a psychological state, we really want to have an understanding of what that represents in terms of the individual. And that's a really good initial uh, way of connecting what are the scores and codes that we're going to provide for people and the characteristics we hope that those represent. One of the really powerful parts in life, I like this chapter so much, um, after we skip some of this uh, uh, fun with the item response theory, uh, coding and math and scaling, um, getting into really his exam, how he um, describes how it works in, uh, in the scales that he's developing. Um, so he again has that very similar scale, but in this way, in this side, it's actually flipped, where it has very mild pathological states here at the bottom, where you have very severe pathology at the top. Very important distinctions that we're describing now. It's well now we have low anxiety. Well, these are some really serious impairments. Then we can describe what are the intended codes that we're going to give to them. Then the items that are on the scale that he is specifically developing are described right here. So for the ones that's relatively indicative of severely pathological, would your like acts of horror um, like horrify your friends? That's a pretty kind of a dark item, and you would hope not many people would endorse that. And then you have um, people that are. Um, dealing with like problems that no one understands all the way down to items such as you try to avoid rejection or you try to just please others. And these are items that we would really expect most people to respond as. And it's interesting how we would, uh, and one of the things he intends is he actually gives uh, what are the intended response for that item um, and to what that would represent. One of the things I really like about this example of a construct map is, again, it maps characteristics of individuals with the items and intended responses with an expectation of the types of individuals and types of sample. So if you just have a normal population of individuals without any expectation of uh, severe pathology, this is how, what proportion or what percentage of the populate or of respondents we would expect to give a response of yes or no. Where we can see a very large distinction between individuals versus people that are really uh, dealing with clinically uh, severe issues in these problems. Basically saying that, well, those that are clinical and have a severe pathological uh, disorder that we really want to help them, they are far more likely to say yes to this item. And that's really the important part about uh, providing these construct maps is it's just a way of connecting the items with individuals, characteristics of individuals, and the intended inferences about them. And so again, I really want to emphasize that it's all about connecting items, individuals, with our definitions. It's a really important it's all about definitions and our expectations about how do these responses and how do individuals respond in the population, or at least to the best of our knowledge, to these to these characteristics of individuals. 
and that's uh, what I'll show in uh, some other examples later on is, well, just because we have a definition for this one specific dimension, well, what happens when we have multiple dimensions? How do we kind of tease apart the, multi the different dimensions to develop a mapping for a contract that's more holistic and a little bit more complex for when we have more complex uh, constructs. Um, and that's what we'll dive into next.